and a happy Monday. It is. Wait, right, here we go. Hang on. Um. Happy Monday. It's given me a um. Giving me this playback error that I've never seen. So give me one second here. Let's see if we can. Uh... Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, we're good. We're good. We're here. Um, it is a happy Monday. It's a happy Monday um, for multiple multiple reasons. Um, uh, the first of the first one that I that I can think of is uh, exam two is now um, over, which is great news for uh, for yeah we are over halfway done we are on week six um, after this week we will be seventy five percent through <clears throat> um, it's going by super fast summer session always um, does. And uh, the first thing that I want to say is um, uh, congratulations again to you all collectively as a class on exam two. Um, let's see. So on exam two, uh, the average uh, was shocking uh, for me to see. Um, the class average was a 90%. You all did very, uh, very, very well. I was expecting, uh, I was not expecting it to be as good as um, exam one's average. And in a way I was right, because exam one had what, a 92, 93%. Um, but this is essentially the same. So so well, well done. You all performed very well. Um, and I'm, I'm so, so happy for um, all of you. Um, Jen, I see uh, you uh, uh, left a comment in the feed saying that you've sent me an email. I'm um, terribly behind on all of my communications. Um, I'm going to be fixing that up between uh, today and tomorrow. Yeah, you guys did excellent. Um, I, uh, over this weekend, was um, plotting lecture notes um, and, uh, and also catching up on my lab exercise grading. So... Uh, if you haven't seen the Canvas post, we're current on all of the um, the lab quizzes. I went through and graded all of the, um, what are those called, the free response questions, um, and entered grades uh, and downloaded, looked at the PDFs, made sure they're all complete, um, graded everybody's um, lab exercises. So, so all of those are done. Um, yeah, everybody did awesome. Um, I've never had a session where two um, two exams have uh, averages this high. So so well done, and um, and keep up this momentum, right? So we've made it. Well, technically, three exams, right? There's a prereq exam, exam one, exam two. All we have left are exam three and the final, um, as well as the remaining lab, uh, lab assignments, <laughs> lab assignments, lecture assignments. Um, all that good stuff, but but we've had a strong what five weeks, and we're on the last the last three. So let's lean into that and um, and keep up the good good work. So I'm pulling up my um, my lecture. Um, oh wait, hang on. My lecture notes right now. There we go. Um, okay, so let's see. All right. Okay, so where we ended... Um, we were talking about um, solubility, right? Which is the um, the amount 
of solute that can dissolve, that can be dissolved in a solvent. We saw that sodium chloride was very soluble, right? 3.6 grams of sodium chloride can be dissolved in one gram of water. That's like over a third of the mass of water can hold a third of its mass in sodium chloride. Um, almost nothing in one gram of, uh, sorry, um, very little of silver chloride can be dissolved in water, right? It's, it's almost considered, well, it is considered insoluble because so little dissolves in water. Um, in one gram, one gram of water can only dissolve 0. 0.000002 grams, all right? So solubility um, changes depending upon the specific solute that we're talking about. And um, so um, that's the, we introduced the concept of solubility today. We're going to talk about different factors that can influence um, solubility and, and continue our discussion of um, the solution phase. All right, and the, uh, <clears throat> the first um, factor that we want to discuss, we want to talk about solubility Um, and temperature, all right? How does temperature affect solubility? And the answer to this question of how does temperature affect solubility depends on um, the type the, of solute that we're talking about. Um, so if we're talking about um, solid solutes, all right, solid solutes, Um, become more soluble at higher temperatures, all right? Temperature increases um, results in higher solubility. Higher solubility, I should uh, specify in um, liquid solvents. And this should make sense, right? Because when you think about it, the liquid phase has more energy than the solid phase. And so if we're talking about a solid joining the liquid phase, getting dissolved in solution, it needs to gain energy to join that solution. So increasing temperature will also increase its solubility. All right, this is contrasted with the effect that temperature has on gaseous solutes. All right, gaseous solutes, when a gas dissolves in a solution, temperature increases um, result in lower solubility. Um, lower solubility in liquid solvents. All right. Gaseous solubility results, uh, uh, gaseous solutes have lower solubility when temperature increases, all right? Um, we've all experienced this. Uh, I experienced this um, yesterday. I was uh, going to the store and I was drinking a thing with bubbles in it. And uh, I left it in the car. I am, um, I, I, I have a, uh, a Prius that's like a dark, dark, dark gray. And when I bought it, I thought that color looks cool. I, I, I bought it new. It was like my first new car that I ever um, owned. So it was a big moment for me. And I like got to pick the color. So I'm like, oh, that dark gray looks sick. Not that any Prius looks sick, but it looks <laughs> cooler. It looked less lame than all the other Prius colors on the lot. And uh, so I picked this dark gray color. And um, little did I know, and actually I did know this, but I wasn't thinking, that when you buy a car that's a, 
it has a dark color paint job it just sucks the heat out of everything and it's always this like flaming hot inferno so it's a it's like it hurts you to put your hand on the wheel um in summer and so i went into the store left my car for like 15 minutes i just needed to get like milk from the grocery store came back and my car had heated up and all the bubbles were out of my lacroix um because my lacroix was now 100 degrees like everything else like the prius i left it in right and that's an example of how an increase in temperature decreases the solubility of the CO2 gas in that solution. The reason why an increase in temp decreases the solubility of a gas is, you think about it, gas phase, high energy, higher than liquid, right? If you want to dissolve more gas in a liquid, you got to drop the temperature down. You're trying to pull it out of the gas phase into the liquid phase. That's why when you keep your soda cold, it keeps its bubbles longer. It doesn't lose its carbonation as fast. But when you heat it up, it, um, it, uh, it you, you, you decrease your solubility, you lose your bubbles, and uh, all you have is this weird juice that no normal human would drink. Um, <laughs> I, Prenza, I am right there with you. <laughs> I, I like my Prius too. The funny thing is, um, so my, my Prius is dark gray. My uh, my younger brother, uh, who's he's five years younger than I am, um, he just bought his first new car for the first time. He also got a Prius, and he picked one that was black. <laughs> so if I, if I made a bad choice in color, he made a, uh, a worse one. But um, he doesn't have to suffer like we do, because we, we live out here. Um, he lives in Palo Alto, so uh, it's not quite as hot, so it won't be a problem. Or at least as big of a problem for him like it is for us. Alright, so that's how solubility affects temperature. Uh, if you want to dissolve a gas, you want your solution to be cold. You'll dissolve maximum gas if it's cold. If you want to dissolve a solid, you want to heat things up. Alright? And that will, um, that will increase the solubility of your solid. Now, um, pressure affects solubility for gases. All right, so when you want to talk about pressure, um, oh, hang on. Um, when you want to talk about pressure, sorry, hang on one second. My Wi-Fi has been acting up today. Um, okay, um, when you want to talk about, actually, that's, right, that's like the third time I've said that. Um, I just have to pull, pull up YouTube on my phone so I can see the comments. Because, um, my secondary monitor just went down. Alright, whoa! Okay, okay, sweet. So we are still streaming, which is good. Um, so, uh, pressure. That's not gonna work. Hang on one second. I gotta do. There we go. Um, so the pressure, the way pressure affects solubility, um, is as follows, um, increasing pressure Uh, increasing pressure um, increases the solubility of uh, gaseous solutes um, 
All right, and this is something that you also see um, when it comes to uh, marketing, selling carbonated beverages, right? Whenever you crack open a can of something, the can makes that sound, right? What that is, is that's the sound of gas escaping. See, all of our carbonated beverages are stored under high pressure. That means that um, more gas can be dissolved in that solution um, because increased pressure increases solubility. Now, when you crack it open, the pressure becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure and gas starts bubbling out. You start losing um, the gas that was dissolved under high pressure in your solution. But that's our uh, workaround as the human race to, um, to uh, selling, packaging, and enjoying um, carbonated beverages. All right, so this is, um, you can think of it, you can th think of this phenomenon as, um, as, uh, you can think of this as the, um, um, uh, you can think of it as a high pressure pushes more gas, uh, more gas particles into solution. All right, so that's a way to kind of think of and understand um, that phenomenon. <clears throat> um, now I want to take a minute to um, talk about, um, there's there's basically three different kinds of solutions, and we're gonna s just spend a brief moment on the first two, and uh, then most of our time with the third, all right? So you can have what are called uh, saturated solutions. And if you have a, excuse me, a saturated solution, that means that it has, um, that solution has dissolved the maximum um, amount of solute. All right, you've dissolved the maximum amount of solute in a uh, saturated solution. Um, in a super saturated solution, all right, yeah. In a supersaturated solution, you have dissolved um, more than the maximum amount of solute. And you may be wondering, how can you how can you dissolve more than the maximum? The the hit, and we'll we'll talk about that in a second. And then you have what we call unsaturated solutions. Which is exactly what you think it is. You have dissolved less. than the maximum amount. I'm sorry. All right, now, saturated solutions make sense. Um, right, you just dissolve the maximum amount. You can dissolve 0.36 grams of salt in one gram of water, so you do it. And now you have the max amount. Um, unsaturated solutions also make sense, right? You, if you had one gram of water and you dissolved 0.2 grams of salt in it, it would be unsaturated. You haven't filled it to its max capacity. Um, but 
what in the world is a super saturated solution, right? How is that even possible? And the way you form how it's possible is has to do with the with uh, temperature's effect on solubility. So we said that increasing the temperature increases solubility, right? So at a higher temperature, you can dissolve more solvent than you can at a lower temperature, right? So you heat up water, you keep adding solute, adding solute, adding solute till it can dissolve no, uh, <laughs> dissolve no more, so that it can dissolve. Uh, there I go. Um, so it doesn't dissolve any more solute, right, at this high temperature. And then if you cool it slowly, the water will cool down, but it's still holding more than the maximum amount it could hold at that lower temperature. That's how you create a super saturated solution. Um, this is often how syrups are made. This is how, if you've ever done that experiment um, as a kid where you make rock candy, right, where you heat up water till it's boiling and add all the sugar that can dissolve at that high temperature. You cool it down, you drop a stick in it, and then the sugar starts crystallizing around the stick. That's from a super saturated solution. The reason why those crystals grow is because you heated your solution up, put more solute than it could hold at room temperature, and then cooled it down. That that extra solute is looking for somewhere to go, and so it crystallizes out. Um, so that may be a, a super saturated solution you've encountered. Um, if not, go make rock candy this week with your kids or yourself. Um, everybody could use a little rock candy in their life, right? Um, you can tell them it's like, hey, I learned this in chemistry class. I'm doing science. All right, so that's how a super saturated solution um, forms. We are going to spend the majority of our time talking about um, unsaturated solutions. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so I'm deciding on which way to go here. Okay. So let's talk about unsaturated solutions. All right. So if I were to tell you Exactly, Jen, that is exactly it. Exactly like reducing sauces. Um, those of you with more uh, culinary um, experiences in your backgrounds definitely have experience with uh, super saturated solutions. Um, because again, Jen, when you're doing a reduction, you're evaporating solvent, but that solute stays there and it gets, you know, thicker and, and you make the the glaze or the sauce that you were you were after. Okay. So unsaturated solutions come with a little bit of a challenge because if I told you make a saturated solution of um for example, sodium chloride. Right. If you read something that said um, yeah, a lab prep that, that wanted you to make a saturated solution, um, you know, and, and you could look up if you didn't, but we've talked about it, that um, a saturated solution of sodium chloride is... Point three six grams of NaCl in one gram of water. Right? You put point three six grams of sodium chloride in one gram of water, and you're uh, you're there. Right? That's a saturated solution. Um, but if you had a lab prep ask you to make an unsaturated solution it's nondescript right an unsaturated solution is just less right it's less than 0.36 grams 
of sodium chloride per gram of water. But there's nothing in that un, in the word unsaturated solution that um, specifies how much less, right? Are we talking about 0.2 grams? Are we talking about 0.1? Technically, point, technically zero grams of sodium chloride would meet the description, the definition of an unsaturated solution because it's just less than the maximum amount, right? Um, so because that word, because the concept of an unsaturated solution is so amorphous, um, we need something to cope with the ambiguity of unsaturation. We need uh, a new measurement, a new set of units, and, and that new measurement is known as concentration. All right? Um, concentration There are many different types of concentration units. Um, we'll talk, we'll, we'll discuss several of them, but, but concentration at its core um, is a ratio. Whoa, or a ration. All right, concentration is a ratio. It's a ratio between, so it's it's either a ratio between um, the amount of solute over the amount of sol of a solvent or another way another con concentration could also be formulated as a ratio between the amount of solute and the amount of solution. All right, and different concentration units will be different. Some are the amount of solute, some are the amount of solvent. It changes unit to unit, but that's basically what it is. It tells you the ratio between solute and solvent or solute and solution. Now, we're gonna look um, at several of these. Um, but the first concentration unit that we're going to introduce is known as um, percent mass. Whoops. All right, percent mass. This is often um, abbreviated. You'll see it as written like this, percent mass to mass. Um, sometimes, or You'll see it written as percent W to W. That just means weight to weight. Um, but it's the uh, it's the exact same thing. So percent mass to ma percent mass. All right. Um, percent mass is defined as follows. It is the mass of solute divided by, whoops, divided by the mass of the solution times 100, all right? That is the definition of percent mass. It is the mass of solute divided by the mass of solution times 100. And something that should be noted, that the mass of the solution is equal to the sum of the mass of the solute plus the mass of the solvent. So in your denominator are the mass of both solute and solvent together and that's how you calculate um, percent mass. Um, all right, so with this in mind, we can um, solve problems like the following. Um, what is 
the percent mass of a saturated sodium chloride solution. All right, well we know, and, and, and you don't have to have this memorized, I would tell you that a saturated uh, sodium chloride solution is um, 0.36 grams of salt in 1.00 grams of water. You don't need to know that off the top of your head. All right, so we can calculate percent mass um, using the, uh, the formula given. The mass of our solute is 0.36 grams. The mass of the solution is solute plus solvent, right? So it's 0.36 plus 1.00, then times 100. All right, so let's um, crunch our numbers. We get 0.36 divided by 1.36 times 100. We can keep two sig figs because of the uh, numerator. So a saturated solution of sodium chloride has a mass percent of a uh, uh, mass percent is 26, 26 percent. Um, all right, so that is how you calculate um, mass percent. Um, they also, though, that there, there are more problems than just that. Um, we uh, we can do a bunch of different problems like uh, that are a little more challenging, like the following example. All right, so let's try this on for size. Um, let's see. Okay, so a solution of potassium bromide, KBR, has a percent mass of 14.0 um, percent, period. How many grams of KBR are in fourteen point zero grams of solution. All right. So here, anytime you're asked to do a problem that involves a um, a quantity that has a algebraic equation. You want to write that equation down because it will be a roadmap for how you solve this problem. We know that percent mass has an equation, so let's go ahead and write that down. The equation for percent mass is grams of solute, KBR, over grams of solution times 100%, and you'll notice that we are being asked to find our mass of KBR and we're given our percent mass, we know this, and we're given our mass of solution. We know this guy. So we can solve algebraically for KBR, right? So we have um, plug in our percent, 14, is equal to our mass of KBR over our mass of solution, also 14 grams, times 100. Um, to solve, we need to get our mass of KBR on one side of the equation. So we multiply 
both sides here. Um, and uh, let's see, okay. Um, 14 times 14 divided by 100 is, let's see. Let's see, so we have our grams of KBR. Here is equal to 1.96. And actually, um, sig figs are spot on. When you look at our sig figs here, we have one, two, three for our grams. We have one, two, three for our percent. And our answer comes out to be three on the nose. So it's 1.96 grams of KBR is the uh, the answer we're looking for. All right. So those are a couple warm up examples. Let's do let's do one more um, before moving on. This one's a little isn't it one point nine seven. It could be. Let me um. Let me recrunch my numbers. Let's see. We got fourteen times fourteen divided by one hundred. I'm getting one point nine six. Um, really? Okay. Sorry. Let me just. 14 times 14. Yeah, I'm getting that 14 times 14 is 196 divided by 100. So I, I don't know. Um, Yes, I totally can explain why three sig figs. So, um, here, let me pull up a new slide. So let's look at, um, so our calculation for mass of a KBR. We've got 14, so our original mass percent was 14.0. I don't think so. Oh, okay, okay. I see where this is coming from. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my percent looked like a seven. I'm so sorry for throwing you off. Um, that's just my sloppy handwriting. Good news is that um, on exams, I type questions, so you'll never think a percentage is a seven. I'm so sorry uh, for the confusion. Okay, so where did the sig figs come from? You've got 14 percent. 14.0%, uh, which has three sig figs, times 14.0 grams, also three sig figs. But this guy right here, if you're wondering, but that 100 only has one. Um, this 100 is not measured. Right, this guy is exact, so it'll never, exact numbers never limit your sig figs. All right, so that's why when you punch this into your calculator and it comes out to be 0 0.96 grams, there's exactly three sig figs here, and we can keep three sig figs because we multiplied a number with three times a number with three. It told, now, now I can't not see sevens when I look at my um, when I look at my percentage, the way I write percentages. Okay, so that's where the three sig figs come from. All right, let's take let's take a look at one more example. Yep. Okay. 
Okay. This one's kind of the hardest, hardest of them. So 44.0 grams of lithium iodide um, is dissolved is dissolved in water to form a solution with a percent mass of 33.3%. What was the mass of water used to make this solution? Okay. So, um, let's take a look. So in this problem, we want to find our grams of H2O. All right, that's what we want to find. Now let's look at what we're given. We're given um, our mass of lithium iodide, right? That's the mass of solute. Um, and we're also given our percent mass. It's 33.3. Those are the only two pieces of information um, listed for us in the problem. But we have a quantity percent mass that has a algebraic equation that goes along with it. So often that is the critical piece of information we need, that equation, to solve our problem. Now percent mass is the mass of our solute divided by the mass of solution times 100. But you'll notice we weren't asked to find, we were asked to find grams of water. Right, we want to find mass of water. And mass of solution is not mass of water. Solution is solute together with solvent. So, When you look at it, we can rewrite our denominator to be the mass of lithium iodide, mass of solute, plus the mass of solvent. And now we have an equation we can solve because we've been given our percent mass, we've been given our mass of lithium iodide, and now we can solve for our mass of H2O. All right, and I'm gonna do this, we're gonna do this on the next slide. All right, so first thing, um, I'm gonna rewrite um, this equation. So percent mass is equal to mass of lithium iodide over the mass of lithium iodide plus the mass of water times 100, right? So we can plug in our numbers. That's our percent mass is equal to our mass of lithium iodide, 44.0 grams over 44.0 grams plus the mass of water times 100. 
All right, first thing, we need to get our denominator out of our, or get our variable out of our denominator. So we gotta multiply both sides by 44.0 grams plus the mass of H2O. And what we do to one side of our equation, we have to do to the other. I'm just gonna scoop this over. All right, so we got 44.0 grams plus mass of water. Um, here our denominator cancels. So we get 44.0 grams plus the mass of H2O times 33.3 is equal to 44.0 times 100. All right, um, you may choose some different algebraic steps than I choose. And that's totally fine. Um, I'm going to divide both sides by 33.3. So these will cancel. And now I get 44.0 grams plus the mass of water equals 44.0 grams times 100 divided by 33.3. The only thing left for me to do is to subtract 44.0 grams from both sides because that will um, isolate my mass of water on one side of my equation um, and then I'll be golden. So moving over to the next slide. Um, I have that my mass of water is equal to 44.0 times 100 divided by 33.3 minus 40 Four point zero grams. Now, I've got to do this in two steps. The reason why is because we have the multiplication rules for sig figs up first. Um, yep, divided by 33.3. Just the 44 times 100, though. Yeah, Kate, the uh, divided by 33.3 .3 happened right here. Oops. Um, because I had to divide 33.3 .3 from this side to get my water isolated. All right. So we've got to crunch our numbers in two different steps because this is um, right here. This first part is multiplication, division, sig figs. And then this part right here is addition, subtraction, sig figs. So we have different rules for sig figs going down, which means we've got to take them one step at a time. Totally, totally. So 44.0 times 100 divided by 33.3. .3. Um, and we can keep three of these sig figs. Comes out to be um, 130, whoops. 130.3. Rands minus 44.0 grams. All right, and this is keeping it to three sig figs because we have three up here, 
three up here, and that hundred is exact. So now one thirty, oops, one thirty-two minus forty-four point zero. Um, my calculator is telling me that my answer is eighty-eight. When it comes to sig figs, my last sig fig in one hundred thirty-two is in the ones place. The last sig fig in 44.0 is in the tenths place. We got to roll with the least precise. So 88 grams is the correct and final answer. All right, and so that is the mass of water that we had to. Um, dissolve our 44 grams of potassium iodide in to form a solution with a constant with a mass percent of 33.0 and that is the tale of that tape all right now um now uh so that is the uh the mass percent um, concentration unit, it's not the only concentration um, unit out there. There's also, um, nope, um, something called percent, wait, sorry, there we go. Um, percent volume. <laughs> yep, they, they can and they make us walk off cliffs sometimes. Um, so percent volume, which is often abbreviated as percent with a V over V at times. Oh man, that is a fierce little kitty emoji. Um, percent volume is uh, technically, it's the volume of solute divided by the um, volume of solution times 100. Um, this one is not as common. Um, The most frequent use that this unit gets um, is uh, it's not as common in, in a chemistry context, um, but it is used for um, for alcohol. All right, so if you've ever wondered what is that percent like, if you buy. Um, like a bottle of vodka, for example, most vodka is like 40% alcohol. People talk about percent alcohol. It's the volume of solute, which is ethanol, over the volume of solution, which is solute and solvent, um, together. So it's it's all of those percentages. The percent alcohol is, um, is just percent volume to volume. Um, a so, so it's there. You've seen it. It exists. Um, Uh, one unit that is more common than percent volume is um, something called the percent um, percent mass to volume. All right, and specifically, this is a ratio of the grams of solute divided by the milliliters, so the volume unit is specified, um, of solution times 100. Um, so it's specified that it's the milliliters of solution, but there's an important, um, an important note here when we talk about milliliters of solution. Um, 
floor. Hang on. Got to move this over. So the one thing that I want to point out is um no oh, hang on. There we go. A solid solute does not add any volume to the liquid solvent. All right, the solid solute does not add um, <laughs> um, I uh, so the 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 uh, the solid um, solid solute does not add any volume to the liquid solvent. So technically, the milliliters of solution are equal to the milliliters of solvent plus the milliliters of solute. But because the solid solute does not add any volume, this isn't contributing anything. So when you're calculating percent mass to volume, the milliliters of solution are equal to the milliliters of solvent. You don't have to worry about the solute adding any volume there. Yes, I can. Um, actually, here's a... Uh, so, so here's, here's um, Susan asked a great question in the feed, which was, um, can I give a real life example of adding a solid solute, or a solid solute not adding volume to a liquid solvent? Do this experiment tomorrow. Tomorrow, when you make your cup of coffee, and of course everyone's coffee is gonna be red, Fill it to like the very brim, all right? Fill it to the brim. So here you've got your coffee. All good, fill full like right to the top. Just very, very, very intense. All right, now, and just to, just so we all know, whoa. There we go. This is coffee up in here. Fill it to the very top. Then take sugar Right, you've got your Spoonful of sugar. And dump it in. The sugar, and I should say, if you're stirring, if you're stirring, If you're stirring your coffee, um, the sugar will dissolve and not cause the coffee to spill over the edge. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> say, oh my gosh, yes. Um, why wait till tomorrow? I can, yeah, totally. You can totally make some right now. This does not have to wait for tomorrow. Um, science cannot wait. Um, and so that's a real life experiment where you've got a solid solute, you've got your liquid solvent coffee, and when you dissolve your solid solute, it will not increase the volume. Now, what will cause it to overflow though, is if you add a liquid solute, if you fill it to the ebb, up to the brim with black coffee and then add creamer, it'll totally spill over the edge because the volume of a liquid solute plus a liquid solvent add together but a solid will dissolve and won't change its actual volume. Totally, so, so, that's, so that's a real life thing. You can do some chemistry and make some coffee. Um, it's a win-win, right? It's, it's, that, is, that is pure win um, for education and alertness. Um, all right, so uh, this new unit, um, percent mass to volume, um, is rather common. Um, <laughs> total, it'll, it'll, you'll never look at it the same again. It's, 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 it almost feels like magic. Like you're like, but where did it go? It got dissolved. It's really, really something else. Um, this new unit, um, percent, uh, percent, what am I saying? Percent mass to volume, um, is rather common and it can allow us to do calcul uh, examples like the following. So let's try this one on for size. All right. Um, a solution of potassium chloride has a percent mass of 19.0% and a density of 1.012 grams per milliliter. What is the percent mass to volume for this solution. All right, this one's a little bit of a mind bender. All right, but let's set this up the exact same way that we want to set anything up first. What are we trying to find? What are we trying to find? Well, we want to know what our percent mass to volume is and percent mass to volume is just the mass the grams of KCL over the milliliters no not right now not right now oh, no. on the side of the oh mom did yeah oh she okay does she tell her to call triple A Okay. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Um, so, uh, over our milliliters, so we've got mass of KCL over milliliters of um, our solution. Um, times a hundred. All right, now, um, so this is what we're trying to find. All right, now let's look at what we're given. All right, we're given uh, the percent mass. All right, we're given percent mass and we're given density. So we know that the density of the solution is 1.012 
grams, now this is grams of solution over milliliters of solution. All right, and then we're given the percent mass. Now, up to this point in time, we've just looked at percent mass, right, as a percentage. It's 19.0%, right? Here's the deal. When you're given percent mass, this is a ratio, all right? It is literally, it literally means that you have 19.0% grams of KCL in 100 grams of solution. And you can use mass percent in either of these forms, all right? You can use it as a percentage like we have before, or you can say this is literally 19.0 grams of KCL in 100 grams of solution. And what I want us to do, what I want you to do, is to compare this ratio to where we want to get to. You'll notice that you have grams of KCL in the numerator of what we want, right? Percent mass to volume. And you have grams of KCL in the numerator of what we've been given. The thing that needs to change is we've been given that we have 100 grams of solution, but what we want to get this to are milliliters. And the way you get from mass to volume is with density, all right? I'm going to show us how on this next slide. So again, we have 19.0 grams of KCL in 100 grams of solution. Um, um, and then we multiply. So what we need to do again is we need to convert from grams of solution to milliliters of solution. And our density tells us that there are 1.012 grams of solution in one milliliter. Right? So grams of solution cancels. We're left with milliliters, which is what we're after. And now we're good to multiply, to crunch our numbers, to multiply this on through. Um, all right, so we have 19.0 uh, times 1.012 divided by 100 grams. All right, this is giving us a decimal Right, our answer is a decimal. It's 0.19, uh, 0.0228. Um, and when you look at the number of sig figs we can keep, we can only keep three. Um, so 0.192. Now, again, this is a decimal, right? And the way you convert a decimal to a percentage is multiply by 100. So this will be 19.2% is the percent mass to volume. Alrighty. Um, I, so that is where we're gonna pause lecture. 
Um, this was a bit of a weirder problem. We'll definitely do more like this um, tomorrow. But what I'm going to say is um, let's hold questions uh, for uh, tomorrow's lecture slash office hours because I just um, missed a call from my wife who just ran out of gas. Um, and so I've got to go uh, help her out. So anyways, I will catch you all tomorrow. Um, and I hope you have an awesome Monday. Go make some coffee and do an experiment. Later.